No one ever thought to warn me about customer service. I had to learn the truth myself. Over the ten years I dealt with customers, I built up quite a large file of terrible stories. This will be one of the worst. My career started at a home decor and clothing store that had just opened in my city. At the time, I was two months past my 18th birthday. Things had been going smoothly in my life until my dad gave me the bad news. If I wanted to get my license, I'd have to get a job. It wasn't something I'd wanted to do. At that age, working rated one step away from just living torture in my young mind. I must say my opinion hasn't improved much since then. It didn't matter though. No driver's license rated even closer. It represented pure, unfettered freedom to me and I'd have done anything to get it. A few long weeks of job searching landed me a cashier position selling discount clothes and home goods. I had no clue what to expect, but I soon discovered that my assessment of having a job as being torture wasn't going to be far off. Just my first day, I was screamed at by two separate women about an incorrect price. I was close to quitting just then, but my mother convinced me to tough it out. Things would get easier, and a year seemed to fly by. I assumed because I had decided to stay when so many hadn't, I got a promotion. This was the day that I became a member of the customer service department. I was about to discover why all the girls in customer service were so miserable. Work was the same for the most part, except I was now full time and nothing stood between myself and every fat housewife who was having a bad day. I'm not being mean, this description will play a part in the story to be honest. When something got messed up, I could usually calm the customer down and smooth things out. On one particular day, not a single thing I tried would work. I'd only been clocked in for about two hours. I was assisting another customer when I heard a ruckus going on a few registers over. When I heard the cashier say, You need to talk to customer service, ma'am. Every inch of my body tensed up. This customer was someone I'd had to deal with at least three times, and it never went well. She spoke loudly like normally, but she was angry. Her voice cut through you like a knife. She waddled her way over to the counter where I was standing and began yelling about us, trying to rip her off. Her fury grew with every word. When the color of her eyes began to darken, my blood started to run cold. I didn't know such a thing was possible, but I instinctively knew it couldn't be good. She must have known she was getting the results she wanted and demanded to see the manager. Unfortunately for both of us, I was the highest ranking employee available at that time. When I told her this, I made a mistake I still regret. I let a smirk show on my face. This is when she slapped me the first time. I thought I'd been hit by a truck. Before I got the chance to come to my senses, a flurry of kicks and slaps fell upon me. It was soon to get even worse. I guess my attacker was crouching over me and losing her footing. All 300 pounds plus of her crashed down upon me. All the breath inside my body was knocked out and... I started to feel like I was suffocating under her weight. I'm a small girl, just shy of 5'2". At the time, I didn't even break 100 pounds. Every inch of my body told me to scream, but I couldn't. This made me panic, which just worsened. I'm not sure what the others in the store were doing during this. I do know I was mere seconds away from blacking out when she rolled off of me. A large rush of air filled my lungs. I gulped and gasped for at least a minute. I was looking around, terrified that the attack was going to continue. When I did catch sight of the woman, I freaked out and crawled behind the counter. She was fighting to stand up, finally finding a pair of men to help her. Realizing she made a big mistake and lightly a bit embarrassed, she quickly waddled from the store, and I didn't dare come out of hiding until the cops finally arrived. The paramedics checked me out and I was found to be okay. Several witnesses gave their statements, but... No one could identify her by name, and apparently she only ever used cash when checking out. That night, the local news showed a clip of the store's video asking for help in doing so, but nothing ever came of it. She appeared to be MIA, even though she was a frequent shopper for quite a while before that, I do believe. It really made me lose a lot of faith in the justice system. It seemed like they just didn't care after all I'd been through. For a long time, probably a year I feared she'd return to the store or I'd see her around town. I'm happy to say that was 2012 and I haven't. 
I was allowed to take a few days off after the attack and my boss even offered to move me to the back. I think she thought I was going to quit. I will admit it was tempting, but I didn't want to let that psycho scare me off. I continued doing customer service until this whole pandemic began and I got a job working from home. As I said at the start, this may have been a one-off, if not the worst of my customer service stories. Now that I'm no longer working with the public, I realize just how crazy some of them are. Let me leave everyone reading this with a little bit of advice. If you ever find yourself in a situation similar to this, or any in which you don't feel comfortable, just call the cops or security right away. I've seen men threaten cashiers and had women call me all kinds of disgusting names. The days of chivalry and good manners have passed. Keep yourself safe from the Karens. This story occurred during the 2017 Christmas holiday. I was living in a city about 700 miles away from where I'd grown up. Every year for the last five, I'd return to my parents' home to celebrate the holiday with them. This year would be no different. My job at the time was to provide customer service for a global computer software company based in my state. Five days a week, I spoke to customers, some furious and some clueless. The call that spawned this mess started like almost any other. The gentleman on the phone had a few questions regarding his warranty. I answered them as well as I could. Once or twice there was a brief gap in the call as I waited for the computer to give me the information I needed. As you do during periods of silence, the caller began making small talk. I joined in, not thinking anything bad would become of it. Over the course of the discussion, he made note of my accent and asked what state I was from. I answered and it turned out that he lived in that state. Before I knew it, we were discussing our hometowns and he turned out to live just a town over from the one I'd grown up in. The entire conversation seemed innocent. When he asked if I ever went back home, I said I did every Christmas. Nothing more was said after that. He thanked me for my help and hung up. The call was so ordinary that I'd forgotten about it by the end of my shift. A few weeks would pass and I would take a flight back home to celebrate with my parents. The scary part of the story begins here. It was December 23rd and I was helping my folks put up the tree. The doorbell rang and when I opened the door, a man I didn't recognize stood in the porch. I kindly asked him if I could help. He looked at me, puzzled, and said something like, Mike, come on, it's Daryl. These are not her actual names, of course. When I talked to you on the phone, we made plans to hang out. I honestly had no idea what this man was talking about. He reminded me, and the discussion slowly came back to me. I did remember some vague talk about us possibly getting together, but no vital information had been shared. I was just trying to be nice like you do to strangers with common connections. I never had any intention of meeting the guy. Most men understand this silly game, but he obviously didn't. He had me backed into a corner. I didn't want to be rude, so I made up a story about being needed around the house. This wasn't a complete lie. I suggested we could possibly meet up the next day and asked for his phone number. This answer seemed to please him and he left. I'm ashamed to admit, it took me a few hours for the oddity of the situation to hit me. First and foremost, how in God's name did he get my parents' address? I know for a fact I never gave it to him. I'm still not sure how he got my last name. The creepiness of the situation made me shiver. Now I found myself at a crossroad. Did I call him and ask how he found me, or do I just ghost him and hope I didn't hear from him again? After a long night of tossing and turning, I chose the latter. Call me a wuss all you want, but I very much dislike confrontations. This path just sounded easier to me, and it's too bad it didn't work. Christmas Eve arrived, and I planned to spend it with my extended family. Things went well until my phone began to ring at around 10.30 that evening. No one I knew would call me that late, or so I thought. I answered with a bit of a curt tone in my voice, and Daryl came at me with an attitude from the start. Hey, I'm the one that should be mad. We were supposed to go out tonight, and you bailed on me. His tone set me off. I told him I never promised him anything. 
and he shouldn't assume someone would be free to drop everything on Christmas to meet up with a stranger. He began to talk, but I cut him off. I continued by asking him how he got my personal information and told him I didn't appreciate him showing up unannounced. Uh, you told me your last name when we talked about hanging out. Don't you remember? I just looked up your parents' address in the phone book. I was at a loss for words. I still insist I never gave him my last name, but somehow he got it. Him saying I did made me even madder. There was no way I was going to let this dude gaslight me. I'd had enough of his games. And as calmly as possible, I told him to never contact me again and hung up. As far as I was concerned, it was over. Only after I calmed down did I begin to wonder how he got my cell number. And this made me furious. So furious I threw my phone against the wall as hard as I could in a fury. And now that I think about it, it was probably the right idea. Christmas Day was spent with my parents and went by quietly except for one creepy interruption. I'm not sure Daryl was involved, but it's highly likely. About the time we were sitting down for dinner, my parents' home phone rang. My mom answered it and said hello a number of times, but the caller didn't speak. My mom, being busy, shrugged her shoulders and hung up. My guard was up and considered the recent events. I figured it was Daryl trying to intimidate my family. Fortunately, I'd kept my family out of the business and they thought nothing of it. The subsequent incidents I was expecting never came and the remainder of my time there went by smoothly. My last encounter with Daryl was probably the creepiest of them all. The morning of the 27th was my final day in town. I was scheduled for an 11 a.m. flight. My dad and I were heading out at around 8 and I was standing next to the car giving my mom one last hug. I happened to glance over my shoulder and caught sight of someone standing behind a tree. They were about 50 yards away but I could tell. It was Daryl. This shocked me but I was able to hide it from my parents. I insisted to my dad we needed to go. There was no way for me to know what he had planned but I had a hunch my presence was keeping him there. As we passed him, he stepped behind the tree, but the tree was too small to conceal him, and our eyes met one another's, and I could see the hate seething from him. It was honestly one of the more surreal experiences of my entire life. My dad noticed him at that point and made a comment about how only a crazy person would be out on a 27 degree morning, and he had no idea how right he was. The flight home went off without a hitch. I was relieved to be back to somewhere I felt safe. The possibility of Daryl doing something to my parents stayed with me for several months, but things turned out to be just as I thought. I must have been the sole focus of his obsession, or whatever you want to call it. There was also the worry that he'd show up in my apartment, but that never materialized, thank God. Work was awkward. With every call, I expected to hear a Daryl on the other end. That, too, never occurred, and now that I'm working and living elsewhere, I'm not as worried. Nonetheless, I'm always aware of my surroundings. You can never be sure when your enemy may decide the time is right to pounce. It may all be a product of an overactive imagination, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. After all, I've got a family to worry about now. This was a few years ago, just after I'd left college. I'd been working at Walmart for a while before moving to the customer service counter. My first holiday season was almost my last. After experiencing the post-Christmas returns period, I'd threatened to quit if my boss didn't move me out. Thankfully, she relented and I was given my own department. That's where I would stay until the next year's returns rush. I was doing my regular thing in electronics when my boss came to me for a favor. One of the girls scheduled to work customer service had just quit on the spot. She couldn't spare anyone else and she knew I'd worked there before. I told her no before she could even finish, but she continued to beg. As one last desperate move, she offered to give me New Year's Eve and day off. It was an offer too good to refuse and I reluctantly agreed. In spite of the desk being backed up to the doors, my fellow co-worker and I were blowing through the line fast. People seemed to be a bit nicer than they had the previous year. That was until I began assisting this unkempt looking man. He had a car seat for a toddler that he wanted to return. 
The guy seemed a little out of it. I had asked him twice about the receipt before he pulled this crumpled piece of paper from his pocket and handed it to me. I unfolded it and began the refund process. As I took the seat from the counter and sat it in a nearby basket, I made a passing comment to a coworker about the guy returning it because he needed to get high. It was just something that I expected from the area, something to that effect. I know it was in bad taste, but my coworker laughed and I returned to the counter to give the guy his money. He was staring a hole through me and gritting his teeth. He said, I heard that. I'd watch your back if I were you. I could tell he meant business. I didn't want to draw attention, so I apologized under my breath and quickly handed him his money. Before he was able to say anything else, I called for the next customer. He reluctantly stepped away but remained close by, continuing to give me a death stare for several minutes. There was something about the look that terrified me. Although I kept working, a feeling of nausea boiled in my guts until he finally left. The next three hours dragged by and because of the incident my mood had taken a drastic downturn. I was overjoyed to see it end but terrified of what may await me outside. There was no way I was going to my car alone. I went to seek out a co-worker that I'd been dating on and off for a while. He agreed to walk me out to my car and we stopped just inside the doors to look out. I didn't see the guy so we continued on. The two of us stopped again briefly but there was still no sign of him anywhere. Customers were coming and going, driving by us. Nothing looked off and we headed across the lot to my car. I was relieved and beginning to think that I had just been overreacting. I knew it was a stupid thing to say, but I didn't know what the outcome would be. Then a car came out of nowhere and began racing up from behind us. The headlights were blinding and I just began to panic and I froze. And if it wasn't for my companion, I may have been run down. He pushed me between two cars, following close behind. As the car sped by, the driver hurled a disgusting name at me and disappeared onto the access road. I thanked my hero and slowly got back to my feet. He insisted that we call the cops, but I refused. As stupid as it may sound, I was afraid involving them could cost me my job. But allow me to explain. I've been chewed out for being rude to customers before. I would have to explain why the man was so angry to me. If my boss heard what I'd said, I'd definitely lose my promised two days off and probably be fired. Rightfully so, I guess. Of course, I could lie and play dumb, but that never works out in the end. I decided to wager on the chance that he was done with me and would move on. And that turned out to be the case, fortunately. Various co-workers continued to walk me to my car after that shift. Two months passed before I figured I was safe and returned to going solo. To this day, I've not seen that man again and hope never to. Whether I just got lucky or he never intended to kill me, I'll likely never know. Either way, I'm just happy to be alive. My attitude towards strangers changed after that incident and for the remainder of my time working directly with customers, I made a concerted effort to treat them with respect. I suggest you take this story to heart. We may all have our little episodes of disrespect when dealing with our fellow person. Nobody's perfect. I'm definitely not. But keep in mind, however, you never really know what a stranger is capable of. One arrogant little slip could cost you your life. This problem is still technically going on. But because of recent events, I think it'll be safe to share it here. To be brief, I had purchased a high chair for an upcoming baby shower. The family member already had a similar chair and I decided to keep it for future births. A year or more passed before I was notified of a recall of that specific item. Several children had been injured by it. I took it to the store I purchased it from just as the site instructed to get a refund. The young man at the counter greeted me with a kind smile and I informed him of the situation. The encounter got very weird after that. I'm not sure if he was trying to be funny, but the way he said it sounded very vindictive. We wouldn't want one of your little angels hanging himself, would we? It wasn't just what he said. He had a creepy smile as he said it. I became livid and demanded to talk to his manager. She soon came out of a back room and I explained exactly what had occurred. When confronted, he insisted it was just a joke. I'm unsure of what occurred after that. 
The manager relieved him and her and I completed the return. I'd go on with my life and things were normal for the next week. The young man had all but completely disappeared from my memory. The following weekend I found myself shopping in the very same store. My son was riding in the basket seat just like he always did. I happened to run into an old friend from high school. I was very excited to see her. I briefly lost focus on my son. My back was turned for literally no more than a minute. The two of us were talking when she pointed behind me and asked if I knew the boy who was pushing my son up and down the aisle. This caused me to come unglued. I turned to see the very same young man pushing the cart holding my son back in my direction. As the cart approached, I screamed at the man to let go. My son, who had up until that moment been having a blast, saw my reaction and began crying. Much as before, the young man had a very casual reaction to the situation. He said something to the effect of, Oh, calm down, lady. The kid's just having fun until you started freaking out. Now he's crying. It's no big deal. You should take a chill. A crowd had begun to assemble around us. Among the group was a store manager. He asked if he could help. I explained and demanded the police be called. We all returned to the office to discuss the incident. Somehow, he managed to convince me the cops weren't needed and assured me the young man was going to be terminated. It seemed like a just punishment. So, I agreed and left the store with no intention of ever returning. Now, we come to this past week. Since the terrifying interaction I had with the young man, I had been staying close to home. Briefly, I thought that he may try to get revenge on me for getting him fired, but a month had passed without any problems. Food was starting to run low. I made my way across town to another store I sometimes shopped at. This place was actually less expensive, but I disliked the quality of their products and avoided it. My shopping experience went off with no problems and the cashier was very courteous. It was looking as if this place wasn't that bad after all. That was until I was loading my groceries into my van. Everything was put away and I turned to return the car to a nearby corral. As I looked up, my eyes lock with those of a young man, the very same I'd been having so much trouble with recently. It was like he'd appeared out of thin air. He had a smirk on his face and seemed to get a kick out of scaring me. He quietly chuckled before speaking. Your psycho behavior caused me to lose my job, but I wasn't fired like you wanted. I've been there so long, they, they just let me quit. And now I'm working here. I was hoping I'd gotten away from you, but it looks like you have some crazy vendetta against me, lady. If you know what's good for you, you won't come back here. When he finished, he turned and walked back toward the store. In a panic, I just jumped in my car and locked the doors. I looked back and forth between the mirrors, half expecting him to just magically appear next to me. The tears came next. They lasted several minutes until I was able to regain my composure and drive away. I knew now that I had to do something. I decided to stop in at the police station to see if I could get a restraining order. An officer heard my story and told me in not so many words that I had no grounds. No matter what I said, I was unable to convince him. Eventually, he came up with an idea. He promised to talk to the young man about his behavior. It was far from what I wanted, but I was going to have to accept it. A few days passed and the officer called to let me know that they had spoken and it had gone well. The boy agreed to stay away from me and I assured the officer that I would do the same, and I thanked him and ended the call. As I'm writing this, the date is November 8th, a Monday. It's been six days since I last spoke to the young man. With little other choice, I've returned to shopping at the first store I spoke of. There's been no sign of trouble. I'm hoping the officer's talk put a little bit of fear of God into him. He sounded very confident in his assessment. I'm sure the police would know better about these things than I do. Yet there's a nagging little voice in the back of my mind. And something tells me I haven't seen the last of him. My 20s were spent much like every other guy's. I accepted every credit card that was offered and then quickly maxed them all out buying stupid stuff like PlayStations and booze. As a result, my credit was in the toilet. 
When I desperately needed a car, it was almost impossible to get one. A lot of the places I tried to rent were denied to me because of it. I wasn't even able to get something as common as a bank account. Within a year, a small overdraft fee ballooned in almost $400 in late fees. Once I lost that account, no other bank was willing to take a chance on me. This meant I was forced to pay to cash my checks at check cashing places and customer service counters. Eventually, I settled in the customer service counter at a nearby Walmart. It was convenient and cheaper than a lot of the other places I'd been to before. They were more than happy to get my money and I was able to shop at the same place. Basically a win-win for both of us. Around the end of 2009, I got my first real job. What I mean is, I worked the usual 40 plus hours a week with the weekends off. The pay was double what I was used to and so was my tax return. I didn't yet become savvy about how and what to withhold, so by the time my check arrived I was sitting on almost $2,000. My first stop was to the Walmart to cash it. Having so much money made me both nervous and excited. For the entire course of the transaction I was a ball of nerves. I was terrified one of the people around me, even a cashier themselves, would knock me over the head for it. When the lady started counting the bills back to me, she practically was yelling out, Hey, look at all this guy's money. I got scared and asked her to count quieter, which she did. I jammed the envelope into my pocket and fled to the bathroom. Locked safely inside a stall, I silently counted it out to myself. I packed it away in my front pocket and exited the bathroom, and only now did I feel safe enough to spend some of it. My primary purchase was a case of my favorite beer, along with a few of my favorite snacks. I grabbed a few shirts and assorted other daily needs. With my shopping done, I checked out and headed out the door. I was now $300 poorer, but tonight was going to be one heck of a celebration. Surprisingly, my fear of robbery was all but gone. I was now far more focused on getting home and cracking one open. That's probably why I didn't notice the guy lurking around my car. He had been hidden in the shadows nearby, just waiting for me to come out. Gleefully unaware, I packed my goodies into my trunk. Only when I closed the hatch did he make himself visible. I was unsure of what he had in mind, but he quickly removed all doubt by raising a knife-filled hand and demanded my money. I considered denying I had any, but I realized that he had been the same man standing behind me in line at customer service. It would be pointless. I was already beginning to shake and trip over my words. My eyes became fixed on the knife. I'd always had a terrible fear of being stabbed and my body was acting accordingly. I was quickly devolving into a state of total panic. He began stepping forward, which only made the problem worse. Then, like a guardian angel, a voice boomed out from behind me. I reflexively turned to see two guys standing with a long line of carts. They were Walmart employees gathering up carts for the night. I stared for a second and the young guy repeated his question. Are you done with that cart? I can take it for you. To this day I'm not sure how it happened, but I became capable of speech suddenly and offered to bring the cart to him. I'd estimated the two guys were about 7 to 10 yards away, and this would be the chance I needed. Quickly, I spun the cart around and began running toward them. I wasn't aware if I was being chased at this moment. I was running on 100% fear. As I got within a few feet, I yelled out to them to run. They paused for a moment, but must have seen the knife or sensed my fear and followed close behind. I eventually let go of the cart as I got closer to the store's doors. I didn't dare stop until I reached the very same customer service counter that had created this whole nightmare and through quick breaths, I blabbed out my situation until one of the associates called 911. I continued looking around for my assailant, but I never saw him again, and the cops did their thing. Only after they had left was I clear-headed enough to thank the guys for helping me. They walked with me as I returned to my car to leave. We shook hands, and I made my way home. I still see one of the guys occasionally when I stop in at a Walmart and remember to thank him, even 11 years later. My would-be robber was eventually arrested on another crime, and I got the satisfaction of seeing him locked up for a few years. I hope he's learned his lesson, and no one else had been victimized by him. However, my life has taught me people like that rarely reform. Unfortunately, 
good people like you and me have to suffer for it. I guess I should start by telling a little about myself. I'm a 36-year-old female living in a large Midwestern metropolis that is not Chicago, and I'll leave it at that. The employer I'm about to refer to probably wouldn't like what I'm going to write about. I'll be smart and leave out their name. As I sit down to write this, it is less than a week from Black Friday, the official start to the Christmas season. Myself, I am a big fan of the holiday. I grew up in a large family that celebrated all 12 of those days, and those times are among my favorite memories. That's why some of the things I saw during my six or so years working customer service make me so sad. Although the holiday seasons held no monopoly on terrible customer behavior, the ones committed during the season of giving always seem to be the most senseless. What I plan to do here is share a few examples of the things I saw. Well, not a list of least to worst, I think you'll agree the last of them is surely the most terrible of them all. So, probably the first customer on customer fight I remember was on Black Friday. I was returning from a break and noticed two women arguing in the electronics section. I do admit I was curious and eavesdropped on the discussion. The gist of the problem was that there were only two remaining models of a certainly highly discounted TV. One of the women only wanted to purchase a single model. The second had to have both because, as she said, the sale is just too good to pass up. I think she had the intent of giving one as a present and keeping the other. The argument was already very heated by the time I'd arrived. Some crude names were exchanged, causing one of the ladies to strike the other. She was understandably angry and ran off to find a manager. The assailant took this opportunity to grab both TVs and run for the registers. She was checked out and halfway to her car before the victim returned. She was livid when she realized she'd been tricked. My next example was less head-shaking and far scarier. I will admit this was something I didn't witness firsthand. This happened about a week prior to Christmas. A couple were in the store stocking up on food for their upcoming celebrations. Like the previous incident... An argument broke out over the last available product. This time it was a frozen turkey. The exchange was heated, but unlike some others I'd seen, this wasn't just two Karens slap fighting over a cheap item. The husband was furious from the start. Things got scarier when the small woman pushed the man's wife. He stepped in and punched the small woman, knocking her completely unconscious. To make things worse, she hit her head on the concrete floor when she landed. Everyone around just froze and went silent. From what I heard, even the husband was shocked at what had happened and went quiet for a moment. He did regain his composure quickly, however, and both he and his wife fled from the store. Paramedics arrived soon after. From what was said on the news, the lady ended up being okay. I'm not sure if the couple were ever caught. The final store was the one that almost caused me to quit my job. It happened a few days after Christmas of 2019. The store was packed, including customer service. As to what caused the incident, I only know that it had something to do with one of the participants banging their cart into the other. Anyone who's been in a busy store has expected this. It's certainly not a crime worth killing over. Unfortunately, the victim of this didn't think so. I think there had been a previous encounter, but the rammer was able to get away. To their dismay, however, their path of escape was blocked by the crowd at customer service. And right before her eyes, I watched in horror as the angry party caught up to their prey and stabbed her multiple times. She didn't seem scared afterwards either. She simply threw the weapon down and walked calmly from the store. Luckily for the victim, several of the nearby customers knew what to do. They were to keep her alive long enough for the paramedics to arrive and rush her off. Despite a lot of internal damage, surgeons were able to save her life. I haven't heard any updates on her condition since, and I pray she's made a complete recovery. The attacker thankfully was arrested and is serving a sentence in prison. Since that time, the world has gone through a catastrophic illness and many lives have been altered forever, my family among them. I've been unable to return to work after my illness, which was a particularly nasty case. Unlike a lot of Americans, my income was only a small amount of what was being brought into the home. Therefore, Looks like our Christmas will be a decent one. And as this story draws to a close, 
I beg you to keep in mind the many who have had their lives ruined through forces they could not control, and a few who are the authors of their own ruin. Just because this time of year may be one of joy and family, not all have much of either. Please, be kind to your neighbor and avoid squabbling over soulless material items. Even a little disagreement can quickly grow into a life versus death exchange. Carry the sentiment of kindness and brotherhood with you. Share it with all you meet. It could be just the thing a stranger has been searching for. Bless you all and I hope everyone has a joyous and memorable holiday season. I love Let's Read. Over three years have passed since this all played out. In light of this, I feel it's time to share my part with others. I can't think of a better place than this channel, a platform used by millions of complete strangers every day. Despite hiding behind a burner account, I'm sure you do enough digging you'll discover my name. But whatever, you can't hide forever. This all started in mid-2016. I applied for and was hired as a cashier trainee at a local department store. Everyone at the store seemed nice. I got along especially well with another new hire. We'll call her Beth for the sake of clarity. I believed our shared unsureness with the job was what made us such fast friends. And friends we were. For the better part of the year, we worked the same shifts and often stayed the night over at one another's apartments. I even served as a bridesmaid at her sister's wedding. That's why what happened next just threw me for such a loop. As the Thanksgiving of 2017 approached, the search for a couple of people to move up to customer service began. Both Beth and I put our names into the hat. It never once entered my mind that it wouldn't be both of us that got the jobs. In a move that shocked a lot of people, I was chosen, but Beth was not. What I didn't know at the time was she had more than one customer complaint on her file. Most assumed that this was what stopped her promotion. Although this caused a small amount of dismay, Beth appeared to have taken it in stride. I had no doubt had she kept her nose clean, she would have been working alongside me the next time an opening came up. Even though the job situation was completely out of my hands, it did drive a wedge between us. We were working different shifts most of the time. When we shared a day off, she'd always have some reason to flake out on me. The next string of events would shed a little light on what she had been doing on her off time. The holidays came and went. I was now able to relax a bit since I'd first taken the customer service job. This is when a 25-year-old guy in sporting goods caught my eye. Let's call him Mike. Things went slow in the beginning. We'd swing by one another's departments and flirt a little. A few months passed until we decided to take the next step. All was well until the day I received a text from Beth. It consisted of just three words and left me very surprised and confused. You backstabbing wench, she said. None of it made sense. I contacted her and was immediately hit with a torrent of curses and accusations. I eventually got her to explain the problem. Unbeknownst to me, Beth had been dating Mike when he and I met. According to her, everything was rosy with them until I came along and stole him away. I tried to explain my side. At no time did Mike ever mention another girl. If I would have known about the two of them, I definitely would have backed off. She refused to listen, so I ended the call. I then contacted Mike, and he had a much different story. He claimed that they had only seen one another a handful of times. It was never anything close to a commitment spoken of. One interesting fact he mentioned was that Beth constantly droned on about a friend at work who had stabbed her in the back over a job. Based on her text, I could only assume she was talking about me. Things were now a lot clearer as to her behavior after I was promoted. Although very torn, I wasn't about to end the relationship at this point. All I could do was pray that her and I would be able to work things out and I could get my friend back. It all had to be just a big misunderstanding. I was still under the foolish delusion that I could have them both in my life. Then, Beth took a high dive off the deep end, almost taking Mike with her. I still remember it like yesterday. I was working an evening shift as usual. Mike had the day off and was bumming around the house playing video games. About 8pm I got a call from him. Beth had just left a message saying that she was threatening to take her own life if he didn't come talk to her. 
She had sent him countless texts all day begging him to come over. He had been ignoring her up to this point. I made the mistake of feeling sorry for her and suggested that he should go see her. This sounded like the perfect chance for all of us to get together to work things out. I would join him in about an hour. We said our goodbyes and hung up. We now move forward almost 45 minutes. I was making my way to Beth's apartment and I got a text from Mike. I almost screamed when I read it. It was a trick. She tried to kill me. Got away but stabbed a few times. Ambulance to hospital now. Though somewhat overwhelmed with a blend of emotions, I reached the hospital. After a brief panicked search, I found Mike. I was relieved to see him awake and talking. His hands had several slashes and one strike had punctured his left shoulder. There was also a minor cut on his forehead which bled worse than the others. While the doctors stitched him up, Mike explained what had occurred. Things had started calmly but Beth quickly demanded that he break up with me. The violence began when he refused. She drew a steak knife from her pocket and attacked him. He fought her off and fled from the apartment. At the time he was being transported, she had barricaded herself in her place and refused to come out. Any hope I had for our friendship was out the window now. I could care less what happened to Beth at this point. It was almost daybreak when Mike was allowed to go home. Our local news outlet was already beginning to report on the incident, and Mike and I were curious to hear what had transpired overnight. And it turned out Beth had attempted to take her own life while locked in her apartment. Officers were able to breach the door, found her clinging to life after ingesting a bottle of Vicodin, and against all odds, doctors were able to save her life. She may have been better off dead. After Mike's testimony, she agreed to a deal which saw her sentenced to 12 years in prison. I can assure you she's not made for it. I wouldn't be shocked if she didn't try to take her life again. I only hope that someone in there looks after her. With Beth finally put away, I expected Mike and I would be able to settle down and maybe make a family together. And I'm sad to say that the stress of the situation along with a few differences and beliefs proved to be too much for us. We finally threw in the towel this past fall. Although things didn't work out, I wish him a long and happy life. As for the woman who caused all this misery, you can probably guess my wishes for her. Happy holidays, everyone. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that join button, the big one, <laughs> to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel, and check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Look at anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.